So they're switching horses now, um, you know, frequency hopping. Is, uh, I think you accused me of doing that to you several times when we served together. Um, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about Russia. Um, so, again, start out with an overview of, you know, how do you view Russia? Are they a significant threat to the U.S.? Are they a flash in the pan? And our allies, uh, how would you view them? Yeah, Clay, as, you, as I frequency hop with you here, I think it's, it's worth my earlier point about how things are interrelated to take a moment right now to try to reemphasize that. Anecdotally, I'll just throw out to you again, we, we all have had some incredible experiences over the last 40 years. One of, one of the uh, experiences that I'll never forget, I was working at the CIA as a three star for John Brennan. He walked in in the morning, this would have been 2013 ish or so, maybe 2014, uh, right after the Russians invaded Crimea and kind of tongue in cheek said, well, another intel failure. And, and, and folks around the room kind of chuckled a little bit. Um, the point being, we saw that coming. It was kind of telegraphed by the Russians. Um, we thought we had good sources and access, which we really did. And most of Putin's advisors were saying, don't do this, boss. You're, it's, a, it's, it's an overreach. It's a stretch. Um, but we didn't have access and placement in Putin's ego, egomaniacal uh, brain. And he decided, I'm going for it. And to his credit, they got Crimea, I mean, uh, with, with very little pushback. Here's my point for the interconnection, though. In the immediate aftermath of Russia's seizure of Crimea, our U.S. response, among the other Western responses, was to put sanctions on the oligarchs, various oligarchs that supported uh, Putin. It, it was the tool we had sort of going to war, and so it's the tool we played. Russia's response, and we had very uh, you know, discreet intelligence on this, was to turn to China and offer them a $500 billion oil and gas deal with the caveat that, by the way, if you sign up for this, the tie that binds economically, we will not push back in the international, in international forums for any of your efforts to, to uh, rectify your territorial disputes. And so we saw that deal thrown out there. It was like, whoa, bold move. We didn't think this. They went to China. It took China about two months to mull that uh, deal. And then you can look back at this historically. They signed that oil and gas deal, huge oil and gas deal with Russia. And obviously Russia needed that being a, a single economy. Uh, and then in short order, slapped down the East China Sea air defense identification zone and then went on to build out the South China Sea. Since that time, you've had Putin and, and Xi Jinping talk about each other literally as bosom buddies, uh, you know, and, and just odd lash up. I mean, it's, it's, it's uh, you know, we, we, to me, I recall Sino-Soviet friction and this seems to have just cast all that away that now it's a new kind of relationship. Uh, but they are melded together with one, with one foe, one adversary, us. Now, do I think this will last for long? No. I, in fact, I think China's using Russia as a springboard uh, and will leave them in the dust as they continue to climb. Uh, and I think Russia's aware of that and do doesn't want to be discarded. But for the time being, they've got this weird symbiotic relationship. Now, on to Russia specifically, my contention is, and it's a little bit, it, it is contentious, is that we didn't win the Cold War. I think we spiked the, the football on the one yard line. Uh, the USSR dissolved. That was a surprise. You know, there's a few people that claim it now that they saw it coming. I think it was a shock to all of us back in that, you know, 89, 90 time frame that, wow, look, check this out. We've gone from Gorbachev and Glasnost and all of a sudden walls are coming down and, and the USSR is dissolving of its own, it's imploding. Uh, and it's, and it's not a, you know, uh, uh, world-threatening implosion. It, it actually seems to be settling out. Where I think we spiked it on the one uh, was, and I can remember I was only a major at the time or so, the discussions back then specifically dealing with Ukraine and the expansion of NATO was, we don't want to force our own Versailles. We don't want to be such a brutal piece that it invites them back out to play. And so we, we, we well, we did NATO expansion through the Baltics and some of the other countries, we stopped at Ukraine. And in my, my opinion is we left a big fat piece of red meat on the table. And Putin's been only too glad to say, hey, here's, here's the launch point uh, for me to reestablish you know, Russian, you know, Russian greatness. Um, and, and, and obviously, well, I think he's mired in Ukraine. I think he got some national uh, kind of domestic uh, props back home for, you know, for at least uh, you know, rekindling their desire to be a great power again. I would say the reason that there there are threat and they never stop being a threat is moreover than China, uh, they are they have an incredible nuclear capability. And to me, kind of a scary fashion. It's almost like we didn't learn in the wake of the Cold War, where we uncovered all their doc doctrine and documents, 
and they were all about first use, to, of, use of nuclear weapons. I mean, they were going to go nuclear in a hurry um, if we did the fold a gap and all the, you know, our normal war plans, which shocked people that, wow, we, that wasn't part of our calculus. We're, would we have been prepared to do the same? Well, since then, you've got Putin back out uh, rattling really bizarre, uh, showing the same tendencies, certainly, but with bizarre uh, kind of trappings of non-strategic nuclear weapons. I don't, I, I don't consider any nuclear weapon, I don't care if it's a nuclear pistol, to be non-strategic. I mean, it, it, it is a level, a, a threshold um, that we, we kind of hold near and dear of, you know, in, in terms of mutually assured destruction and whatnot. Uh, yet he's talking about, no, tactical nukes might, might use them. And now I'll have all sorts of new delivery systems that you won't be able to come up with either. So here we are, year 2020, and he's rattling a, nu a nuclear saber that um, it, it certainly has my attention. Sir, do you think um, uh, with that, with their capabilities, nuclear capabilities, are their strategic goals regional, uh, focused on NATO, or more global, returning to superpower status? Are they suffering from a superpower uh, hangover? Uh, the you know that type of thing. Um, it's it's hard to say. You know, I, for years I've heard uh, Russia can't sustain this. I, I think I've heard that for over a decade now that. A single source economy, oil, uh, can't sustain it. Um, they're going to have to settle down. They, they, uh, they can't play this hand. If, if, uh, if it's a weak hand, they're playing it very, very aggressively. I mean, right now, um, not just vis-a-vis -vis NATO, uh, but in Syria, in Libya, pushed uh, main battle tanks into Nicaragua over the last three or so years. Why? Just because they can and just to provoke us. Um, so he – and he's – trotting out all sorts of new military kit. My joke is that he seems more proficient at printing money than we are. You know, we have a tri crisis, we print money and throw it into the system. Uh, somehow or another, he's, he's been able to do the same thing. So I, I think they have grand goals. They want to, they, they, you know, they, Putin can remember being a, a, a world power. I mean, he, as a young K KGB guy. Um, so certainly I think he, he, uh, he, he aspires to get to that level. Um, and then, of course, they see NATO um, as its own challenge, but kind of their own, uh, you know, strategic play field to, you know, to, to address. So, sir, um, on Russia with regards to strengths and vulnerabilities, I know we, you know, you hit on their, currently their economy is, is, is not a strong point for them um, and lack of diversification and things like that. But Let's start with their strengths. I mean, what would you say uh, Russia brings to the table militarily and, and economically? But what do they bring? Yeah, I think you got to start uh, closer to home domestically and specifically in the personage of uh, Vladimir Putin. I mean, uh, the, the joke I heard several years ago, it was a joke at the time. I don't think it's a joke anymore, is he's not going to go out vertical. Um, he's ego, egomaniacal. Um, he has clamped hard, you know, I mean, shoot, did he just try and kill, kill Navalny? Is, uh, is, you know, one of, one of, one of the few that dare to uh, confront him more than likely. And we're all kind of saying, well, it's just Vladimir. It's just what they do. You know, no, uh, you know, no, no big deal. Um, so unfortunately it's pinned on one guy, which to me is, you know, scary that he has that much potency. Um, he he you know, has played his national following in terms of, again, kind of like Ch China, we've been bruised, we've been abused, NATO's an affront to us, et cetera, to galvanize the Russian public to, you know, essentially give him a blank check uh, to pursue uh, what he wants to do. Militarily, obviously, still very strong. I mean, uh, uh, it's not necessarily how they operate. I, uh, <laughs> we went toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Russians, or at least Russian paramilitary forces in, in Syria and, and 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 did did very well, uh, you know. Uh, so I I don't give them props for having uh, a lot of reps for how to use all their tools and kit, uh, but they 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 certainly have some potency there. The one area that they're really really good at, uh, and again you you wish we could mirror image to just pick up our own game, is uh, and someone couched it. You and I remember a guest speaker who came to us at SOCOM that said the Russians don't conduct information warfare; they conduct warfare on information. They completely disrupt uh, mm. and and challenge everything that we take to be factual and stable, and 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 just create the most cluttered, uh, you know, kind of disrupted uh, 
battlefield or, or domain, and then they operate very smoothly inside that. Um, they, they're, they're expert at that. They, they, disinformation is their stock and trade, and they're, they're really, really good at it, and, and we, we could go to school on them, we, and we certainly need to counter it. Um, and so, and follow up with that, sir, or follow on vulnerabilities. I mean, clearly the economy is a vulnerability for them uh, militarily. Yeah, again, economically, people have been citing that as the forever weakness for the Russians, but somehow they're surviving. Uh, but yes, conversely, information space, uh, literally the world's opinion of them, how the rest of the world is, is functioning relative to how, you know, the normal you know, Russian uh, you know, lifestyle and, 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 uh, and, and livelihood, I think, are areas where we, we, we can and must play back more aggressively. Uh, you know, the Baltic countries live in this space actively, uh, Poland, Romania, et cetera. Uh, they, I mean, they have to compete with them and they're doing it. Um, I don't think we, we've lost you know, the Voice of America approach to, you know, to get after this that I think had something to do with the dissolution of the, of the Soviet Union. Uh, but I, I do think it's an area of vulnerability for them. Sir, with regards to our uh, current strategy with Russia clearly uh, uh, by, with, and through NATO, uh, one, do you, do you see that working? And if not, how would we, how would we tweak that? Yeah, at one of those four-star sessions I sat in, and I, and I wasn't trying to be the devil's advocate, uh, but we were talking about how we were going to address Russia like three or four years from now. And I said, okay, if Putin's having this meeting right now, and I hope his meeting was a little more substantive than ours was, um, I think he's taking stock for what you know, what's he's accomplished over the last you know, couple of years. Um, and I think if I were Putin, I, I think a, an honest self-assessment would be, hey, uh, played a good quick hand into Ukraine and, and Crimea, but now we're, we're stuck. We're mired in the morass of Eastern Ukraine. Don't know how to get out of it, but you know we'll figure that out over time. Uh, I think Putin would acknowledge, I have played an overly uh, aggressive hand in, in NATO to this point where Sweden and Finland, as I interacted with them personally, are closer to NATO than they ever have been. The Swedish, you know, Chad or Vice Chad at the time told me when I visited there, we are one parliament, one parliament away from joining NATO. And uh, which shocked me because they've always enjoyed that kind of in-between status, but they see Russia as such a threat that, that they were almost there. The Finns, of course, uh, you know, point of pride for them are, hey, we're the last country that ever kicked the Russians' ass, uh, you know, back in the World War II timeframe. Unfortunately, we were hitched to the wrong side. They were hitched to, to the Germans, so they, they paid a price for that. Um, but uh, both those countries are more aligned with NATO than, than they were in the past. Uh, the Baltics, Romania, and, and uh, you know, uh, down through you know, uh, the Balkans, I think are challenged almost on a daily basis just from proximity. You could argue that uh, if you're Putin that, hey, we've, we've had some interesting inroads with Turkey, uh, they may be more in our camp than they are in the NATO camp. You know, that, uh, I'd, I'd be hard to push back on that. But the bigger issue that I think that they brought out, Clay, and, and one that I'm very concerned about, and I, I mentioned it in a dinner that, that I uh, attended in New York, and it was a question about NATO, and I wasn't trying to pull any punches, but I said, I wonder how uh, stalwart NATO will be in the event that one of the Baltic countries is, is invaded, uh, which is kind of the forever question for most of the war games. I said, for instance, in my conversations uh, with members of old NATO, specifically Spain, I'm not sure Spain would go to war uh, for Lithuania, Latvia, or Estonia. And uh, interestingly, uh, I was interrupted, and it's a big dinner with about 30 people there, interrupted by Gary Kasparov, the Russian grand chess, ma or, uh, chess champion. And Kasparov said, oh, General, uh, you, you are wrong. Start much further to the east. Germany will not go to war for Estonia, Latvia, or Lithuania. And I said, well, okay, um, <laughs> that may actually be true, um, another man's opinion. But the point being the elephant in the room is, is NATO more than just a facade that will not do what it's designed to do um, if Russia you know, put presses against one of those uh, Eastern European countries. And, and so we, you know, we, we have to, we either have to reinforce the essence of NATO or acknowledge that hey, it's really, there's no there there. It's, it's, a, it's a false front. No, sir. Thank you very much for those thoughts on, on and China that's my, and Russia. That's my opinion. So I don't want to, 
where they <laughs> emphasize that uh, almost, I'm sure all the NATO uh, you know, aficionados are, would, would be losing their mind right about now, but that's just my opinion on it based on interacting with some of our European partners. No, no, and uh, I would tend to agree with you or certainly share the same concerns. Um, so we're shifting gears now. So we talked about obviously the, uh, the two big elephants in the room, China and Russia, but as you know, our, our, our new national Clay, defense. Clay, just before you do that though, because it, um, it's going to play to one of these other threats coming up. Um, you know, as far as our strategy for Russia going forward, um, we, have a, we have an opportunity right now, Belar you know, Belarus, you know, uh, how is that going to bring, mm, what are we going to do? Good point. There's some practical uh, examples or opportunities out there right now um, that you know, I hope somebody's rolling up their sleeves and get after. But, but much like one of the other ones that you're going to bring up, our whole approach is really, really complicated by the personal relationship between Putin and our president. And I know it, it flummoxes national security planners and decision makers in terms of, okay, what, what is the connection? Is there, you know, is there a connection? Is there, are there special deals, special conversations that are happening? Uh, but there is a, you know, a, uh, a vulnerability on our side in terms of what's the personal relationship and what's our, you know, policy and national approach mm. uh, to, you know, to the problem. No, that's interesting. I hadn't considered that. Um, and sir, good point on Belarus. You're right. There, uh, opportunity knocks uh, there. And, uh, you know, will we take advantage of it? A big question mark there. 